Hey there YouTube, well I'm in my garage today, I'm going to be doing some welding and fabricating. I'm going to be building a movable uh, mount for my blacksmithing post vise. Now I have the area for where I do my welding fireproofed, but unfortunately I just can't fireproof my entire garage. So I need a vise that I can take out into the middle of my garage, so when I do some cutting or some grinding, the sparks aren't flying against my walls where it has the potential to start a fire. And also, I need a vise that I can move to the middle of the garage floor where I'm hand forging so I can do any bending, twisting, or uh, upsetting. So what I thought I would do for you guys today is to show you how to square a piece of tubing or pipe to something flat. Now, for tools for this job, you're going to need a square and or a level. Now there is one assumption you have to take into account when you fabricate this way. You have to assume that both your parts are flat and square. If they're bent, this method won't work. Or if this is a wobbly surface here, this isn't going to work. Fortunately for me, both of these are. Alright, so the trick to squaring a piece of tubing to something flat is to find what's called the high spot on your tube. Now when tubing is cut, it is not always cut at a perfect 90 degree cut there is usually a bit of an angle on here, whether it's a, like an 89 degree cut, 88 degree cut. What happens is there is a slope on this part and you wanna make sure that you tack your part on that high spot. Because what can happen is if you tack on that low spot, when you try to move your part into position to square it on the opposite side, you can't because the high spot is then resting against your base metal. So I'm going to run through you with you guys here how I do that and show you a few other trips along the way, or tricks I should say, along the way. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my square, hold it up against my base and my tube. Okay, I can see that there's a gap up here. So that means this tube needs to come in this direction. So my high point is somewhere on this half of the tube. I can put my square on the back side. And the gap is on the bottom of my square. That means it needs to go this way. So again, now I know my high point is somewhere probably in here. And I put my square right here. There's a gap up here as well. Not as big of a gap as there was over here. So again, two needs to come this way. And when I put my square up against here, a gap on the bottom. So because I can see a gap on the top of my square on this plane and this plane, that tells me that my high point is probably somewhere right here. My first tack is going to be right here. Now if you knew this same process with a level, the thing to remember though when using a level is when you put it on this tube to square it to your surface, you do not square your tube to the earth. What I mean by that is when you put this square or this level, I'm sorry, on your tube, you cannot center your bubbles into the leveling lines. Because if you do that, you're squaring this tube to the earth. And that, uh, be, when you square something to the earth, that does not necessarily mean that this plate here is also square to the earth. This is laying on a garage concrete floor. This floor may not be level. So if I use this method, and I square this tube to the earth, it's not going to be square to this plate. So what you would do, you put your level on your plate, you look at your bubble. I can see that my bubble is touching the left line. So when I put this up here, I can see that this one is breaking the right line. So this would have to come this way. Now the nice thing about this level is you can actually keep it on your tube while you're welding or tacking your part up. Whereas this guy, you have to take him, check it, tack, take it, check it, bend it, check it, bend it. This can go a little faster, but you have to be a little bit more careful. But today I'm just going to be using the square. So high point is here. Put this square over here. Today. Because the smell is kind of dirty, I don't feel like cleaning it, and 
I'm not convinced that I'm gonna get a hot enough weld, I'm gonna be using stick weld, my stick welder. So I can show you a couple little tricks when using a stick welder. So the kind of electrode, uh, electrode I'm gonna be using is called 6011. The nice thing about 6011 is that the flux that's coating the electrode is not cellulose based. Now with 7018, uh, those rods are cellulose based. And what that means is when they are in the, just a room, or once you open the package, they begin to absorb moisture. When they absorb moisture, they become less efficient and they lose their tensile strength. So your welds just won't be as strong. Now, in this setting here in a garage, if you were using 7018 rods and you had some that were maybe you know, a little bit old and you weren't doing anything structural, not that big of a deal. But in the uh, like a construction setting, you have to keep your rods in a rod oven uh, while you are welding and then take them out, let them cool, and then use them one at a time. You can't just leave them out in the air. Um, they lose their tensile strength. That's a whole slew of OSHA violations. So these rods, 6011, do not, are not cellulose based. Um, the disadvantage to these rods, those are kind of, for lack of a better word, they're kind of dirty. The arc just isn't as clean. You don't get as nice of a clean weld as you do with 7018. But for what we're doing here today, it's fine. These also tend to give you a little bit better penetration and they're not as fickle. These things will burn through darn near anything. Um, dirt, oil, and gosh, sometimes even paint. And you're always better off cleaning off your welding surface. But again, for today, what we're doing, not a big deal. So I've got my welder set up to 80 amps. It's a little bit hot, but again, we're tasking. We want it hot. Now, some electrodes, when you buy them, they have a little bit of like a coating here on the end. And what will happen is if you try to uh, ground out your arc, start charging, it won't happen. You have that covering on there. So what you can do is just take that rod, scratch that off, and then you got your bare metal. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a decent sized tack on my high point, then get my square and start squaring from there. Ugh. This is going to be a, it's always a challenge with a flip helmet, but I think we'll be okay. All right, here we go. a good size tack on that because we're going to be uh, reefing on this. Now also, when you use a stick welder, this actually shoots the metal out in a bit of a cone. And what I mean by that is, after you finish welding, there's going to be a bit of flux extending over the electrode. And you're going to have a hard time getting an arc started. So what you can do, pull up, break that flux right off, and I got your exposed electrode and you're ready to go. So now that we have a tack, we can take this square, hold it up to our part. You can see my part needs to go this way, just ever so slightly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around the other side, and I'm going to push on that pipe just a little bit while I am tacking. And what's going to happen is when, as that um, tack cools, it's going to pull the tubing this way. So I'm going to keep my hand on it to keep it from pulling. But I'm also going to push it a little the path to where it needs to go. So as that tack cools, it should uh, cool fairly square. So this needs to come right there to be square. It's not much effort. Just kind of going to use some muscle memory here to remember how far it has to go. Now this is the advantage to using a level. The level, you just throw it up there, you can look at it. I just don't feel like using a level right now. Oh, I also need to get to the stick hole this way. Tack on here with one hand with a stick welder. That's not going to be fun, but it is what it is. Alright, so a little bit of pressure. Here we go. Ooh. Like I said, a little bit rusty with the stick welder. That's one more time. Yeah, you want some decent tacks on there. Drop that flux. I'll check it from the square. Mm. 
Okay, so uh, full disclosure, that first, or that second tag didn't go very well. I wasn't pushing it up on the tube, and it was uh, too far this way, and when I weld it, it pulled even further and pulled it out of square. So in the interest of time, I grabbed the tack off, tacked it, and made sure it was fairly square before I turned the camera back on. And now, I'm not absolutely perfect, but you have a hard time fitting a dollar bill in that gap. So we're pretty good. So now, it's square on this plane. Now we have to square it on this plane. So we're going to repeat the same process. Here. And that is actually pretty darn square. Check it on the other side. It should be pretty square too. It is. Okay, so we're in a bit of an interesting spot right now. Here's why. What we have to do now, tack one side and then right away tack the other. What's going to happen is if I just tack this one side, just let it sit and let it cool, it's going to pull the tube this way, pull it out of square. But if I hurry and tack the other side, then the other tack's going to cool and hopefully it'll kind of pull it back in the other direction and correct itself. So I'm going to go ahead and throw two quick tacks on here, check and see how we did. is cooling, it can pop. I think what my tacks just did, yep, the front, I'll go ahead and re-wall that. There we go. Alright, so we got some decent tacks. Stick welders, as they well, they leave a flux or slag on the surface of your welds. So, as they cool, they don't get porosity. I'm going to go ahead and make this tank a little bit bigger. A little small for me. The other ones don't look too bad. So, Let's check it one last time. Beautiful. Slight gap on the bottom. Barely any light going through that gap. Oh, very nice. Same on this side. Look at that. Beautiful. How you square a piece of tubing or pipe, something flat.